He has cholera. <clears throat> I'm so sorry. <gasps> Papa, Mama, listen to me. I had a dream about the future. I will become an engineer, and I will be world famous for my inventions. Nicola, my son. Before you were born, I made a solemn vow to God that you would serve him. If he heals you, you <laughs> will become a priest. Papa, please. I know I will recover if I become an engineer, and then everything <gasps> will work out for the best. Please forgive me. I beg of you, forgive me. Yes. Fine. You can be whatever you want to be. I give you my blessing. Mr. Tesla, I imagine because you are here now giving me this interview, that must mean you've recovered, thanks to God or someone else. Yes, to the complete surprise of everyone in my village, I made a complete recovery in just a few days. I continued in school, at the Gratz Institute and Paris University becoming a successful electrical engineer. The illness led me to discover abilities I never suspected I had. I started to have these clear visions. Flashes of light began to cover the pictures of real objects. In time, they simply replaced my thoughts. My mind developed a new and different process. Using this process, I could construct an invention in my mind first, where I could perfect it. And only after designing it completely in my mind, would I then test it in the laboratory? That's the way it's been all of these years. Stop that. Writing down the story of my life, you will need a lot of ink. Here, you can use this instead. This is a device for recording sound. Quite a great invention. It was not me who invented it, no. It was that damned Edison. Say something. What should I say? Whatever. Say something. What should I say? Whatever. Now, let's start from the beginning. I first met Edison in Paris in the year 1882. I met him because of inept engineers. The Continental Company owned by Edison couldn't finish the construction of a power plant. A plant for the Strasbourg railway station. They promised to pay me $25,000. If I was able to figure out what the problem was, I managed not only to find the defect, but fix it. By spring 1884, the power plant was working. But when the time came to collect the $25,000 they promised me, the Board of Continental refused to pay me. Hmm. They told me that I had merely been a consultant to them. What crooks. I resigned at once. Well, I heard that you actually worked for Edison again after that. Yes, I was a young, vain fool. That first time should have taught me not to get involved with Edison again. I was even offered a chance to go to Russia at that time. I am Serbian. For me, it was more natural to become a Russian than an American. But Charles Batchelor from the Continental Company persuaded me. 
And do you know what he had to say? He said he knew only two geniuses in the whole world, me and Edison. He promised me the chief engineer position of his company in America. He compared me to the great Edison, who was an idol to me. I was 28 and unemployed, so it didn't take much for me to completely lose my head. Obviously, I agreed. Edison was always a quick thinker. No wonder they called him Big Head behind his back. But he was a man without a conscience. You'll start as a regular engineer. You'll be in charge of fixing the electric motors and DC generators. But Mr. Batchelor promised me that I... I don't care what he promised you. I employ people and I define what they do in my company. And you, young man, will have to work hard to prove your value to me. Of course, I was never given the chief engineer position. I was an immigrant with four cents in my pocket. I had two options to choose from. I could beg in the street, or show that man my worth. I began to work like a man possessed. For six months, I worked myself to death repairing DC electric motors 18 to 20 hours a day. But the more I worked, the more I understood that direct current was not perfect at all. So I started to design my own concept of a motor which would be able to produce a new kind of current. Alternating current. As opposed to Edison's preference, direct current. Alternating current is changing its magnitude and direction all the time. These changes are called the frequency. But the most important difference between AC and DC is that the direct current power plant using the usual voltage can transmit electricity effectively really no more than one mile. This means that in order to illuminate New York using direct current power plants, we had to build a huge network of local stations. But with alternating current, this would not be the case. Using AC to illuminate New York, we needed only one big power plant. I have been told that you've been working double shifts. Why is that? Can't you keep up with your own job? I can. But I'm also working on the AC machine as well. But AC makes no sense. My DC generator works perfectly. Well, not quite. Show me. It could be improved. Take a look at what I've designed here. You have some brains, but you're a foolish immigrant. Now hear this. If somehow your crazy ideas can manage to improve my inventions, I will pay you $50,000. Understand? I'll do it. But I didn't give up on the idea of using direct current to generate power. I fully immersed myself into the work, and soon was able to present Edison with not one, but 24 different improved direct current motors. Here are all my drawings, sir. Not bad. That is, not bad for an immigrant. So when will I be getting my $50,000? 50000 Young man, you don't seem to understand American humor. Taking into account your efforts, I'm willing to increase your salary from $18 a week to, let's say, $26 a week. Business by nature is filled with cheating, and there was nothing uniquely American in the fact that I was duped. But it was one thing to be deceived by the functionaries in Edison's office in Paris, but here, I quit immediately. I was forever disillusioned in the great American inventor, Edison. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen. Fine. Care to join me? Thank you. 
I try to keep to a schedule. Well, even after you left working for Edison, he said many times that you were only an imitator, that you were unoriginal. Imitator? Not quite. I was always his opponent. I always made other choices. Consider the war of currents. I must admit, the two years after I left Edison were very hard. I had not a penny to my name. I never took money too seriously. I never did, except for at that terrible time. At that time, I worshipped every penny. My breakfast cost four cents. My dinner cost the same. And sleeping on a floor at night cost me five cents. This lasted for a year. In order to earn my living, I had to find part-time jobs. Day laborer, porter, digger of ditches. I lived for the moment. I had no money to think about tomorrow. When autumn came, I rented a single bed in a common room for ten cents a night. What a luxury. Edison must have been gloating. But one day, everything started to change. My friend Brown introduced me to entrepreneurs who were interested in electricity, and they invested money in my talent. It was an amazing transformation. In one moment, I went from being a beggar to becoming co-owner and manager of a serious company dealing with the installation of new arc lamps in the streets. I thought it was ironic that I rented an office next to Edison's company. <laughs> We had received many orders from all over America for our electrical products. Our business quickly became a success. I created models of generators, transformers, and all the necessary equipment for the operation of two-phase alternating current devices. I believed that alternating current was the future, although to others at that time my ideas seemed absurd. And finally, on the 1st of May, 1888, I received two patents for my AC generator. The War of Currents had begun. Mr. Westinghouse. Mr. Tesla. I'm so happy to meet you at last. Let's get straight to business. You know the Edison power plants are reliable. However, here's what I need. I need a solution that allows me to transmit electricity over long distances to my power plants. So, you see, uh, currently I am looking for a better engineering solution. Well, I have some ideas here. Edison's direct current power plants dominated the nation's power needs. By 1887, almost a hundred DC power stations were operating in America. Direct current has no frequency and doesn't change direction. DC generators can be connected much more easily and were more convenient for accumulating stations, but the DC has one huge disadvantage. Because of power losses in the wires, it is extremely difficult and expensive to transmit its power over long distances. After carefully examining Edison's DC patent, the famous industrialist George Westinghouse came to the conclusion that my AC generators were much more effective. So he offered me a million dollars for all the patents I already had, and promised to pay a dollar for each horsepower produced by generators designed by me. So I became a consultant for Westinghouse. That day I gave my dear friend Brown a check for half a million dollars for everything he did for me. A new era began in my life. Alternating current is perfect. It is so pure and beautiful. It has the unique ability to disinfect any kind of surface, including the human body killing microbes without causing any harm to the body's tissues. Is that dangerous? Don't worry. You can touch it. Go ahead. 
There's no need to worry, young lady. I've passed a million volts of current through my body, and you see, I am still very much alive. If the frequency is above 700 hertz, the current simply flows over your body. Isn't it wonderful? Together with Westinghouse, we created the first stable working AC generator. Finally, Edison realized that his reign as the electricity king was coming to an end. Sir, a letter for Mr. Tesla. Edison immediately brought a lawsuit against us for infringement on his patents. But of course he lost, as all my inventions were authentic. It was after that that he started to play dirty. At Edison's instigation, a new type of execution was adopted. The electric chair. And of course, it used my alternating current. Poor Westinghouse objected and even hired a lawyer for Kemmler, who was the first person in the world to be sentenced to death by electric chair. What a grisly way to die. Despite all Edison's attempts to discredit my inventions and tarnish my reputation, my alternating current became more and more widespread. Westinghouse and I were gaining ground in this war of the currents. But the sweeping success of AC played a cruel joke on my benefactor and supporter Westinghouse. One day his investors remembered about the agreement I had made with Westinghouse. He was obligated to pay me a dollar for each horsepower generated by alternating current. By that time, there were so many AC generators, I would have received 12 million dollars and been one of the richest men in the world. But the man who believed in me and in my alternating current would go bankrupt. So I tore up my contract with him. Westinghouse had to continue his fight for alternating current. That crazy Edison wouldn't leave us alone. He wanted to prove that our AC was worse than his DC so much that he filmed animals being brutally killed with alternating current and then showed these movies to the public. Yes, I remember in 1903, that poor elephant, Topsy, he electrocuted her to death. The soup is cold, and Edison lost anyway. In the end, you know what he did? He started producing his own AC power generators and there have been no direct current stations built in 20 years. So, I won. Three hundred twenty milliliters. Plus or minus 15, uh, average to two by circumference. What are you doing? Well, it's a strange thing, but I can't really enjoy my meal if I don't know the exact amount of food which I'm going to eat. As for Edison, I have never seen him again. Never. Even after he burned my laboratory. You mean the fire on Fifth Avenue? Many speculated it could have been sabotage. Even at that time, people were asking which of your employees were bribed by Edison. Do you know how it came to this? For seven years, I worked in my laboratory studying magnetic fields and high-frequency currents. It was a productive period for me. As a result of my work, I received many patents, almost as many as Edison. As a result, the American Institute of Electrical Engineers invited me to lecture about my achievements in front of the most prominent electrical engineers of that time. I lit lamps simply by putting them in an alternating electromagnetic field. I showed how to transmit electricity without wires. I sent out lightning and used my hands to pass a current of a million volts through my body. It was a huge success. I received a great ovation, and for the first time was called by my peers, a man of the future.
They offered me Faraday's chair, saying that since his death, no one else had been worthy to sit in it. Then they let me sip the whiskey from Faraday's cherished bottle. It was a great honor. Edison, of course, could not stand them recognizing me. On the 13th of March, 1895, there was a fire in my laboratory on South Fifth Avenue. All of my property was burned, as well as all the records for the last ten years. As a result of the fire, I went completely bankrupt. Of course, Edison was not so stupid as to leave any evidence that he was behind the fire. But who else could have benefited from this? Within half a year, my business began to thrive again. Instead of starting from the beginning to rebuild what I had created, I restored everything from memory. Thanks to me, Westinghouse triumphed over Edison, winning a huge contract for the construction of a hydroelectric power plant at Niagara Falls. The newly formed company of Niagara Falls invested $100,000 in my research. With this money, I set up a great laboratory at 46 Houston Street, where I constructed a unique mechanical oscillator, which I used to do research on selective resonance. I could destroy the Brooklyn Bridge in a couple of minutes. That's what selective resonance means. It's possible to destroy any object you choose with a stationary uniform vibration. The whole block of buildings was almost demolished. I've read about an earthquake that occurred in New York in 1898. You're saying that you did it? Or perhaps it was just a coincidence. Oh, what a wonderful place it was, my laboratory at 46 Houston Street. Time flew very fast there. I envy the pigeons. They do not need to play stupid human games. They just spread their wings and fly away whenever they want. Without any regret. I don't like people. But I heard rumors about the elaborate parties which you used to organize. Yes, I threw. <laughs> I threw great feasts, which were attended by the most interesting people of the time. Brilliant, famous people. Kipling would read his poems to us. Mark Twain would make everyone laugh with his famous stories. Dvorak played piano. And then I would take them all to my laboratory. I showed various interesting experiments and we talked about the future of science. Those evenings were unforgettable. I met most of these people thanks to my friendship with Robert Johnson, the chief editor of Century Magazine, and his wife Catherine. Catherine and I became great friends because we shared a great love of poetry. I never met a woman with such exquisite literary taste. Together, she and I even translated and published a collection of Serbian poetry. But the poetry we were most impressed by were the poems of Jovan Smaj. Honor can't be bought with gold, for an honest man can't be sold, since he needs it like the sun. The dishonest man would surely sell, <laughs> but everyone knows quite well. As for honor, he has none. Yes, Robert was a dear friend of mine. 
And as for Catherine, oh, I loved her as much as a man can love a woman. And she loved me, but she was my good friend's wife. I've heard that once you saved Robert Johnson's life by persuading him to cancel a train trip, the train he would have been on crashed. I don't know what surprises me more. The fact that you predicted the train crash or that you actually saved the life of your rival. Meaning you gave up your chance to be with Catherine. You must remember Robert was a friend of mine. As for that train crash, knowing it would happen was not unusual for me. I could always foresee the future, but not everyone believed me. I begged my friend and patron, Colonel Astor, not to board the Titanic, but he didn't follow my advice. How sad. Or maybe it was just a coincidence. Speaking of him, I've heard that Colonel Astor, who was the owner of the Waldorf Astoria Hotels, was the one who gave you $30,000 for your research in Colorado Springs. That is not quite true. Mr. Astor financed some businessmen from a local electric company in Colorado Springs who were researching the electric potential of thunderstorms. It was they who invited me there. The fact that Colorado Springs is located in a zone of strong geomagnetic activity intrigued me. What this means is, there are more thunderstorms in that area than there is sunshine. The local engineers wanted to know if there is any way to accumulate the energy produced by lightning strikes and then use it. Of course, I could not pass up a chance to participate in such a unique experiment. The laboratory I built there was ideal. I put up a sign there saying, Abandon all hope, ye who enter here, and began to do my geomagnetic research. In the center of my lab, I built this massive transformer. One end of its primary winding was grounded, and the other end I raised to a great height. As a result, this device was able to store energy and produce a lightning-like current of several million volts and a frequency of 150,000 hertz. But I wanted more. I wanted to know whether this technology could transmit energy wirelessly over long distances using the ground as a transmitter. Not far from the lab, I put 200 bulbs in the ground and waited for a storm. As soon as the ball at the top of the mast was struck by lightning, my laboratory came to life. The transformer collected the lightning energy and threw it into the atmosphere with triple force. Try to imagine it. I had created man-made lightning that was 40 meters long. The energy flow covered the city. The entire city was literally saturated with electricity. I didn't expect such an effect, but my theories had been proven. I was able to transmit an electric charge wirelessly across the ground. 200 bulbs were lit at a 25-mile radius from the Tower Razam. Unfortunately, the local power station was not ready for such a large-scale experiment. The city's generator simply burnt out. After that incredible experience, I wrote an article about the possible uses of currents transmitted by high-frequency standing wave energy. This had practical application for lighting, heating, the control and movement of electric transport. Electricity could be used everywhere. It could be transported through the ground, in the air, used for automatic machines. The wireless uses of electricity are endless. Yes, I remember reading it. There were so many fantastic predictions. How to harness energy from the sun. Aluminum, the metal of the future. Using the Earth's internal heat. Transfer of electric power anywhere in the world without the use of wires. Interplanetary radio communications. It was that article I wrote that caught the eye of the well-known banker and industrialist John Pierpont Morgan. And he decided to meet with me. Imagine how much benefit wave energy could have for mankind. That sounds interesting. I want you to work on the development of radio communications. I need a cheap but reliable connection that will work so I can communicate over long distances. To get you started, I'll give you $150,000 to cover your costs of research. After that, we'll talk. Radio. What mediocrity. But I agreed to what Morgan asked of me. 
to have the opportunity to continue working on the wireless transmission of electricity. We bought several acres of land on Long Island and started the construction of a wireless transmission power station. It was a 57-meter tower frame with a steel shaft that went deep into the ground. A huge copper hemisphere which worked as a powerful amplification transmitter was installed at the top of the huge structure. The idea for the project was to use the resonant buildup of the ionosphere. I was sure that I could accumulate the energy extracted from the air anywhere in the world and use that energy in any kind of form, as an explosion of thousands of bombs or a man-made aurora borealis. I lit the sky for thousands of miles. However, Morgan, that blind man, wasn't inspired. There's something I still don't get. How can we use your light show for the purpose of transmitting radio signals? I'll explain, sir. The real future use of this experiment As is communicating you know, Marconi by Marconi sent radio signals from England to Canada five years ago. I invested in you because I knew about your outstanding abilities. But after what I've seen today, I still need a radio! Mr. Morgan. Sir. Sir. With this plant, we can send energy for thousands of miles, not just some radio signals. You could have a second wireless tower near the Niagara Falls in, things in New unless York. I am not interested they give me an immediate commercial profit. I need radio signal transmissions. Marconi, Marconi! I want you to know I was three years ahead of Marconi, that simpleton. And that Russian Popov! In 1893, I developed my first radio five years before them! Morgan cut off all his funding. The Wardenclyffe project was shut down. In 1917, in the middle of the First World War, the tower, which could have been the beginning of free electricity, was destroyed. The United States government suspected that German spies might somehow secretly use the tower as a radio transmitter. However, Morgan didn't stop me from managing to achieve something monumental. I was able to conduct only one complete experiment under the Warden Cliff project, but how great it was. To avoid any loss of life, I found the most remote location in eastern Siberia and sent through the ionosphere a huge burst of energy to Tunguska. And that is where it exploded. The entire Northern Hemisphere saw that light that I had created. Wait a minute. Are you implying that the Tunguska meteorite explosion was you? I'm not implying anything. I was forced to sign a non-disclosure agreement by the U.S. government. But those who had eyes could see the truth. Come, take a look. No wonder those damn security services still keep track of me. What makes you think he's a federal agent? Shh. Because with the sheer enormity of my intellect, my mind could still create a massively destructive weapon. The Tunguska meteorite was only the beginning. I designed the rays of peace which could destroy thousands of planes a hundred miles away. Every country would be able to defend itself with an invisible Great Wall by putting towers with the rays of peace along their nation's borders. Of course the military would give anything to get their hands on my rays of peace so they could turn them into rays of death. Because if my rays of peace were placed in a certain configuration, anything surrounded by them would be utterly destroyed. I could be the main secret weapon of the Pentagon, but I hate war. But that's the way our world works. Governments have a way of turning peaceful inventions into weapons. I was the one who invented the ability to control ships and airplanes by radio frequency. I introduced the first radio-controlled ship in 1898 during the New York Electrical Exhibition. 
Once I had perfected this technology, I brought about the era of larger, more practical toys. My research and experiments made it possible to control a warship remotely from the shore at a distance of 25 nautical miles. You see, it's really quite simple. Continuous control is possible via an automatically received signal of disparity between the desired and present location of the ship you're controlling, so you can make any object move to wherever you want. Naturally. The military immediately seized on the opportunity to control warships using radio waves. Since that time, the Pentagon has kept their eye on me. It is impossible to refuse them. At their request, I invented a radar locator to detect enemy submarines. Originally, I designed this instrument to search for minerals. I had other great ideas they could use. I was able to generate powerful electromagnetic fields that bend light and radio waves around any object, making the object completely invisible. This project was called Rainbow, but I doubt whether you have ever heard of it. The military can keep its secrets. I hate the military. They enjoy spilling blood too much. I'd really like to do something for ordinary people. <clears throat> But regrettably, they're not ready for my inventions. They're blind and stupid. Once I decided to prove to the general public that energy is present in the air, so I designed and assembled an 80 horsepower alternating current electric motor. Then I installed it in a new car, replacing the gasoline engine as its power source. My electric motor functioned flawlessly for an entire week without an additional power source. It also accelerated the car up to a speed of 150 kilometers per hour. But to my great surprise, none of the entrepreneurs or the public were interested in my invention. It was astounding. Was there really no one who would be interested in something that cannot be sold? Because people would never have to pay for energy from the air. At that time, a couple of newspapers published articles accusing me of having connections with the evil spirit. This deeply offended me. I took my motor and never again showed it to anyone. When I lie quiet in bed at ease, then let my time be done. If you fool me with flatteries, tell my own self's a joy to me. If you snare me with luxury, let that be the last day I see. Goethe. Right. The scene where Faust sells his soul to Mephistopheles. So you have no connections to dark forces? Hmm. I often find myself quoting Faust. He thinks as I do. We are both ready to give everything we have for nature's secrets. Because of this, when I am reading Faust, it helps me to think. My greatest inventions were born while I was engrossed in poetry. In 1915, the Nobel Committee even wanted to give me the Nobel Prize in Physics, but I refused it. The reason? They wanted me to share it with Edison. I must admit, to his credit, Edison did the same. However, I couldn't refuse the gold medal of Edison given to me by the Institute of Engineers and Electrical Technicians. But the very sound of the name Edison annoyed me. So I cut the medal in half and used the gold to pay two of my secretaries for their work. Can I take the dishes and clean the room now? Take the dishes away and leave us immediately. I can't stand earrings, especially pearls. Those earrings have fake pearls. Good for her. The only way I could enjoy talking to such women would be by radio.
as if they were aliens. Hmm. But aliens don't exist. If they did, I'd give anything to be the one to interview them. They do exist. I have talked to them. In the first quarter of this century, everybody went mad because of the popularity of a new medium. Radio. People with money to invest didn't want to talk about anything except that damned radio. I thought the idea of radio was old news and did not want to take part in any of their revelry. But in 1926, the heirs of Colonel Astor asked me to rework the radio transmitter to improve the quality of radio communications. I agreed, only for the sake of my old friend. While testing my equipment, I suddenly caught mysterious signals that were generated by some kind of technology. According to my calculations, they were sent from Mars, with a probability of 94%. But it happened only once. Perhaps it was because Mars was closer to the Earth than it had been in several thousand years. The signals stopped, and I could never prove that I had really caught the radio signals from Mars. But my contact with Mars had become the talk of the town. H.G. Wells mentioned my experience in his novel, The First Men on the Moon. There is definitely someone out there. Someone who wants to meet us just as we want to meet them. I believe someday we will meet them, creatures that can overcome the stellar abyss. We could learn so much from them. Unless, of course, they rip our guts out first. All of us are predators in this universe. You, me, the cat. Is that cat yours? Cats don't belong to anyone. That's why I love them. They produce electricity out of thin air, like I do. And like myself, cats have a free spirit. Here's a storm. So aren't you afraid? Me? Afraid of the storm? <laughs> Once when I was a child, there was a terrible electrical storm. A tree next to me was struck by lightning. I felt as if the electricity was passing through me, but I didn't feel that it was hurting me. That's why I feel like I'm part of the storm. When it arrives. I don't need a generator to produce power. I understand the greatest mysteries of existence. I can control the energy of the universe. I possess that kind of power. Well, now I'm sure the hotel staff will come. And the bill will come to about $200. Excuse me, sir. Can you explain this mess you created? I'll pay for it. Clean it up later. Now mm -hmm. get out. Mm. Luckily, poverty doesn't threaten me anymore. I am the honorary director of the Belgrade Scientific Research Institute. They give me a fixed salary. The motherland helps. As I told you, I can foresee the future. And I will now make a prediction. You'll see one day money will love me so much that my face will appear on banknotes. You mean your face would be on money? Like Franklin, Lincoln, and Washington? I know it will. We've spoken enough of this. Now tell me about the future. You promised. Of course. But you must comprehend that the future begins right now. It should be common knowledge that corporations are buying advanced inventions and then putting them under wraps in order to have a monopoly on technology in this world. In spite of that, these inventions will slowly make their way into our world. Electric motors will replace internal combustion engines. People will talk across great distances using personal radios. Electronic calculation devices will be carried in a suitcase. There will even be a unified information system throughout the world. It will be possible to send any information wirelessly anywhere. And energy, too. Imagine this if you can. We will be able to send electricity wirelessly to the remotest areas on Earth. 
Another startling development will be the creation of artificial intelligence helping humans in their activities, but it will also be used as a weapon capable of manipulating people. The military will use microwaves of energy to disable communications and incapacitate the electronic devices of their enemy. And by gaining control of ionospheric energy on a global scale, we will be able to create earthquakes. I predict you will live to see all these things. What a future. A terrible and great time is waiting for us. For you. But I won't see it. My time is short. I have only one more day on this earth. Tomorrow. You're the last. No more visits, talks, or women. Women? Eleanor Roosevelt, the First Lady. She invited herself to be my guest the day after tomorrow. Unfortunately, Mrs. Roosevelt was so persistent that I couldn't refuse her without causing a public scandal. That is why my departing will solve the situation perfectly. In fact, that's why I agreed to meet you. Because I am out of time. But now that the story has been told, it is time for you to leave. But, sir, we have I wish I could tell you much more about my many developments. Solar batteries. Artificial intellect. Gas turbines. But as I said, I am completely out of time. We will never meet again. No one will ever know to where I've disappeared. But, sir, I... Not another word. Just go. What a pity. You'll never have the opportunity to use all the things you heard from me. When I lie quiet in bed at ease, then let my time be done. If you fool me with flatteries, till my own self's a joy to me, if you snare me with luxury, let that be the last day I see. I'll take that tape recorder you have, please. What gives you the right to demand this of me? I'm protected by U.S. law under the Freedom of Information. Actually, that's not true, ma'am. Everything this man produces is considered property of the U.S. government and subject to seizure. So please, don't make things more complicated for yourself. Now I have a warning for you. If you tell anyone about this, you'll be imprisoned in Leavenworth the rest of your life. Understand, ma'am? Pardon me, but what has happened to Mr. Tesla? Mr. Tesla? He lived here, in this room. No such person ever lived in that room. 